Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 11th birthday and the start of the 12th year of the Investing Roundtable, co-sponsored by Better Investing's Mid-Michigan Chapter and Manifest Investing. My name is Mark Robertson. I am joined here by some dear colleagues in the realm of successful long-term investing. Uh, Cy Lynch from Atlanta, Georgia, joins us tonight, and uh, greetings, Cy. Good evening, Mark and Ken and everybody. And, and Sai is our resident bell ringer that reminds us to be patient and disciplined. And sometimes things take time. And and uh, we appreciate your noble influence over the years, Sai. Thank you, sir. And we're also joined here by the the raconteur of Central Michigan, uh, <laughs> Ken Cavula. Well, investing, you know, a raconteur in the investing sense and others, but welcome, Ken. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, it's great to be here. Nice, uh, very nice audience for this evening. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that we can draw an audience uh, in July. So that's that proves that maybe the, the program still has merit. Well, very cool. And speaking of merit, our distinguished pharmaceutical scientist, I last made contact with him a few days ago, and he was embedded somewhere in Europe, uh, probably in the realm of fighting COVID. So once again, we will allow Hugh McManus to continue whatever endeavor it is he, that he's on and just thank him for his uh, participation over the years also. And in addition to, to the names on the screen, there are so many others, Knights and Damsels. You heard from Herb Lemkul a few minutes ago. Uh, Ann Manning has been here, Matt Spielman, I know I'm going to forget somebody, the, the late Nick Stratagos. Um, did I say Matt Spielman? Yep, um, Kim Butcher. Kim Butcher, of course, I was saving her for last. Yeah, Pat Donnelly. And Pat Donnelly from time to time, so some yeah. really, really good influence. All of those individuals have something very special in common. And it's the the quest to learn and to help others learn uh, and be better investors. And that that's a really cool thing to achieve. And uh, we certainly never stop trying. All right. So anything else you want to add, Ken, or should we get rolling here? No, I'm ready to get rolling, Mark. Okay. Here's our standard disclaimer. No investment recommendation is intended. This is an educational demonstration. The key words are illustration and demonstration. We are basically here sharing the lessons learned over what is now eight decades in the modern investment club movement doing this. Um, and this particular uh, event or session that we do on a monthly basis has now been around for 11 years, dating back to July 2010. And the rules of engagement are always the same. Uh, we will share opinions. We will share uh, our perspective on certain techniques and philosophies. Uh, so they are our opinions. Uh, we do require that you do your own homework before you make a decision to actually hit that buy or sell button or contact your broker. And so please do your own homework. We do try to remember to disclose if we hold positions in our own personal portfolios, in some, in some cases, just people that we know that actually owns pieces of companies in their own personal portfolios. If you'd like to be placed on an event reminder list, just a mailing list to, for email, please send a note to nkabula1 at comcast.net, and Natalie would be happy to add you to that. If you'd like a copy of the slides from tonight's presentation, or if you have follow-up questions, Mark R. at ManifestInvesting.com will reach me and we will try to take care of you. So with that, here's our standing agenda. Uh, pretty much the same for the last 11 years. We hope you're not too bored with it. We uh, welcome anybody that may be uh, joining us for the first time and extra big hug to you. And uh, welcome back those of you that have been with, with us for many sessions over the years. We do keep track of how well we do, so we'll spend some time with the scoreboard. We do talk about portfolio management. That has been a, a real voyage here over the last several years. 
and we talk about the stocks that are in the tracking portfolio and give some perspective on that. You can see that there are only three stock presentations there, LCI Industries, MKS Instruments, and Green Brick Partners. And I should probably give that a footnote. This I'm sharing this idea with Matt Spielman. Matt presented it at the recent uh, Successful Investing Conference. That's been doing pretty well, and it's, it's got that same good old outlook, so I thought I would share it with this audience as well. Um, we do a poll after we finish the stock presentations, and if we have some time left, and we usually do, we'll field some questions and answers. So I think we'll just keep uh, rolling on, Ken. Sounds good. All right, here's your reminder of what we have done for 11 years and uh, want to go forward. We just ask the participants that they share a single favorite uh, actionable investment opportunity. Uh, we do encourage opportunistic speculative investments also, but we don't want them to dominate the portfolio, of course. We'd like to see the non-core selections limited to a maximum of about 25% of the total portfolio. Like I said, we keep track. We want to try to beat the Wilshire 5,000 by five percentage points over the long term, and we'd like to see over half the selections that we make, the decisions that we make, go on to beat the market also. And without further ado, here is our track record over the years, and uh, we have not had a good couple of months. Um, the, although the, the performance over the long term is truly spectacular, that's, you're talking 18.6% as a rate of return since inception. So again, that's an 11 year rate of return at 18.6, but due mostly to our delics, which we'll talk about more in a second here, we have dipped below that 5% objective line for the first time in a long time. We've been nibbling at it for the last three out of the last six or seven months, but uh, we finally dipped below. The markets have continued to be strong. So any step backward is greeted uh, you know, by that advancing market and the relative return has dropped down. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see that recover, but we'll cross our fingers and hope for the best. Our uh, outperformance accuracy was a little bit higher. It has dipped back to 51, but still nothing. It'd be really hard to complain about um, what we see on that screen there. Your thoughts, Ken? Well, I, uh, I'm i disappointed that we're under five, of course, but uh, I think it, it points out uh, the, uh, it's not a problem, but it's, it's a possibility that probably is a little bit more uh, center forward when you move into non-core stocks. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more volatile. They tend to to move quite rapidly sometimes uh, on news. And uh, Ardelix is just an example of a non-core stock that right now is not performing the way that we expected it to perform. Yeah, and for those of you unfamiliar with the story, it uh, it is a stock that went from $9 to $2 in about 10 minutes. And those 10 minutes were also after hours to make it extra special. So. Yeah, that's uh, quite a dent in a in a position. And and I'll chime in right now just for a a, a second. I I I mean I know I I noticed what happened to Ardelix, um, but and and I don't but I don't know anyone who was personally holding or had a stop loss. But lest any of you are out there saying, "Gee, I will use guaranteed loss orders." Uh, that the rest of the world calls stop loss orders to keep myself from that happening. Um, realize if you had stopped our delics, let's say at seven, when it hit seven, it became a market order. You're not guaranteed to get seven out. When it moved that fast, you may have sold out at two. Well, I'm virtually and, certain you would have. Yeah. Yeah. And and where and where that gets really bad is when you have a fall like that, you sell out at two, and the next day it bounces back up to four or five. And that sort of thing happens. Uh, the, the time that I know clubs that got burned was back, uh, those of you who remember ValueJet uh, um, and, and their crash in the Everglades. They had some stop loss orders, but they sold out way below their stop loss order. Because when the plane crash happened, the stock just went in free fall. 
Yep. So not necessarily the protection you think you have. Yep. So that's well, I, I really am, Mark, I'm, I'm anxious to have you back uh, sitting with us and uh, maybe giving us a little bit of insight as to how normal this give and take with the FDC really is. Uh, so yep. uh, well, we're just going to have to be patient. He's, uh, he's working and that's important. Right. So still, although we seem to be dwelling on it, it's kind of like when the child comes home to the parents with the report card in hand and there's, there's five A's and one C, the parents go straight to the C. We sort of been doing that here for the last few minutes. There's nothing wrong with an 18.6% uh, <laughs> long-term return or a or a 4% relative return. I think you'd find that's better than about 99% of the institutional funds. Yeah, and not again, especially when you're talking 12 years, Mark. Uh, yeah. That's a uh, that's just spectacular. That well, kind let's of not get lost on that. All right, here yeah. is here is the tracking portfolio. These are the top 20. I left out the. The split for tonight. I was just sticking with the core portfolio or the overall portfolio. So there are core and non-core listed here. Um, the legend at the top tells you how many times an individual position has been selected. So our our favorite eleven year uh, patron saint uh, selection, cognizant from Sai, has been selected fifteen times. I think fourteen times by Sai. So 15,000. 15, 14 and a half, I think. 14 and a half. Well, that 15,000, 15 times selection <laughs> is now worth 25.5. So it's it's hanging in there pretty good. But that's how you figure out some of the, the repeat selections. And uh, again, not to beat a dead horse, because I certainly hope it's not a dead horse. As a shareholder, our Delix had been picked seven times. That $7,000 had grown to something like 34,000. It was right here. And uh, you can look really hard at the chart. I, I developed eye strain looking for our Delix on this chart. It's actually dropped down to uh, way off the chart at like $3,000 for the position. Uh, so that's, that's what caused uh, a lot of the, that caused the C on the report card. Yeah. But, Mark, I wanna draw, draw everybody's attention. Yours included to universal display. Uh, we have a, an investment club meeting tomorrow, and my wife, who's in charge of our pounce list, is going to ring an alarm bell about universal display. Uh, I, I really think that there's some things going on with this company that, that we should take a careful look at and make sure we understand some of the most recent quarterly data that's come in. So you think we should put that under the microscope for next month? or I I don't think that we have time to do it now. And uh, uh, I was just kind of uh, informed about this within the last 24 hours, but okay. uh, I don't follow this company normally. And uh, I, I just think it's, it, it, it bears some taking a look at. I, I hope that 30 days won't cause another huge drop off the top 20, but uh, I think we should take a look at it. Yeah, I could see where the PE may be, a, be a, a bit ambitious. The analysts have been yanking it around a little bit there, so that could be part of it. But Also, Mark, since you, you happened to send out the, uh, the complete slide deck tonight, I think, based on some later slides you have, this may just be core. Yeah, it's 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 right up there anyhow. It's it's cool. It's no, cool. no, no. What you're showing on your screen, the nine eight matches one later on that you call core. Okay, I, I could be confused about that. I and thought... I see, and I see our delics on the non core at around sixteen thousand. Later on, I mean, you'll you'll oh, catch up with yourself. Yeah, that's. I think that you're looking at an old slide. That's not actually in this deck anymore. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right, then I will stand corrected. I only <laughs> know what it sent to me. It was actually, <laughs> actually a hidden slide. You're supposed to, you know, supposed to be with a secret handshake. I forgot the handshake. All right. Uh, all righty. No, no problem. I almost sent you an old slide today, so I <laughs> know how that goes. All right, good names from top to bottom here. I don't think we need to spend any more time. Other than that, I do like to point out companies like Amazon. A two-time selection, checking in at 
24,000. Those obviously are a whole lot of good, clean fun. Booking, we talked about a little bit this afternoon at Bull Sessions. Even though that's been pandemic challenged, still a pretty good company. And that's uh, been cranking along pretty good. So for the entire portfolio, you can go to this link. And I am 99.9% .9 sure that link will take you to the whole portfolio, to the entire portfolio. We actually have it broken out into two pieces. Uh, but we're going to skip that part tonight. And we'll bring it back next month. All right. Herb Lemkul was with us last month, and he just he just pondered and wondered about the diversification. So, Ken, would you like to discuss whether or not this portfolio is well diversified? Well, if, if this were a club's portfolio, and it's not, it has way too many stocks uh, to be a club's portfolio. I don't want any clubs out there to aspire to 100 stocks in their portfolio. But uh, just looking at that size diversification pie chart, uh, that's as about as perfect as you can get. Uh, better investing suggests 25% faster growing, 25% uh, slower growing, and 50% in the medium category. And uh, these numbers uh, don't have to be precise. Uh, in fact, uh, for a growth portfolio, I, I like the faster to be uh, a little bit bigger than the, the slower. I don't like either of them to disappear, but uh, I like it that way. I think it's important to understand that uh, manifest investing, where these particular uh, pie charts come from, is defining growth based on the percentage growth in sales. And uh, that's a little bit different than the primary definition that's being used by better investing. Uh, better investing uh, acknowledges both definitions exist but better investing tends to use the absolute sales value uh, to define size of company. Uh, they say 1 billion and below are small, 1 billion to 10 billion are medium, and 10 billion in sales or more is uh, large. Uh, so you'll get different pie charts depending on the definition that you use uh, for this small, medium, and large. And uh, I really like would like us uh, at some point to jettison those three terms and replace them with faster growing, slower growing, and uh, call it regular growth or steady growth or something like that, uh, because that's in fact what we're talking about. Um, we have very, very large companies in today's market that are growing at 12, 13, 14 percent. Uh, and we have some uh, superb uh, companies that don't uh, sell a whole lot of product uh, and are growing at slower numbers, but still bear uh, uh, taking a look at uh, on a pretty regular basis. Of the sector diversification, we have a lot of sectors because we have a lot of stocks. Uh, you can be fully diversified with only four, maybe five sectors. And not all the sectors uh, uh, contain a whole lot of growth, which is what we're looking for. It's very difficult to find something in the materials sector, for example, that, that has growth attached to it. So, you know, we only have 2.3% of the portfolio. It's that purple piece is, is materials, but uh, you don't have to have any materials or energy for that matter. I'm surprised that our consumer staples section is kind of uh, anemic in this pie chart. Uh, and I'm not surprised that tech uh, has taken up a, about a third of the portfolio. Uh, that's just the way that the, the cookie crumbles a lot of times for modern portfolios. There's a lot of uh, really great companies in the tech arena. They have high growth and we tend to buy them. Is that enough on that, Mark? I think so. Okay. Uh, the only comment I would make is I don't think that uh, 35 is too much for that particular sector, and that they could even get a little bit more. And yeah, could... I don't, I don't think it's too much either. It just, that's just reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for more on that, if you want to search David Gardner and when you're at Manifest in the search uh, box on the homepage, you'll get a good article on why that's probably not too much. As far as stocks to sell or, or consider selling tonight, these are the stocks in the portfolio that are ranked from the lowest projected annual return. 
So these are the five lowest projected annual return, but they're all very good companies, excellent companies, and they're certainly nowhere near money market rates. EPAM has been just, in fact, Sai, I hope you're uh, doing a golf clap down there in Atlanta. Uh, I am. You must have uh, turned my video on or something. <laughs> that's that's another one of his uh, cognizant imposters that's uh, doing quite well. So I don't I don't see anything to even react to there. The growth rates are high. PEs might be a little bit high, but those are probably pretty good companies. Yeah. Mark, as, as we move into our 12th year and, and we've played with rules for this portfolio a, a number of different times in the past years, uh, I'd like to modify our timeout rule a little bit uh, because I'm not sure that the timeout rule uh, is being applied to non-core stocks the same way it, it, it was applied to core stocks. And I'm suggesting that maybe now that we've actually divided the portfolio, uh, maybe we should revisit our timeout rule and maybe we need a, a variant of the timeout rule for non-core uh, and maybe we leave the original timeout rule alone or, or tighten it up maybe a little bit even for core stocks. Certainly a valid consideration. I mean, we have different selling criteria for uh, pro projected return. Uh, for a core stock, we we hold them until they get down to money market rates. For a non-core, we uh, basically start thinking about selling them if they drop below the market average return forecast. So it would make sense to have uh, a couple of different positions. And we don't really have a good uh, a good guideline to identify what it, what are the exceptions, other than we've flagged them as exceptions. Like our Delix obviously is is a hot mess right now. But A2 it, it, might, it, it might be an interesting half hour at one of our bull sessions uh, to to talk a little bit about uh, about what exactly would make you uh, unload our Delix or A2 milk or or some of the speculative things that we've we've identified them uh, and what would it take to unload them from the portfolio? I you know I I think that's maybe that's more important than some of the unloading from the non-core or from the core side uh, of the portfolio. Uh, I'm wondering if if we shouldn't have an exit policy for for stocks that we're clearly speculating on, and maybe we we should discuss it a little bit. Yeah, it's where it definitely merits more discussion. Good stuff. And last but not least, we don't have any stock that is overheated by virtue of. Uh, a higher RSI, that doesn't mean you run out and sell it, but it just means that you recognize that it may be overheated and and should at least be uh, audited, if you want to think of it that way. We don't have any of those right now. Probably the closest one is Starbucks, I think, when I looked earlier, but nothing jumps off the page. I don't see any, any reason to panic. Um, I am married to A2 Milk, so we can't uh, we can't be talking divorce here tonight on that one. I'm, emo I'm, emo I'm emotionally committed. And our Delix, I mean, I think it's 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 blown way past where you would think about selling it. Probably into the opposite of selling it. Yeah. All right. So with that, let's go ahead. Ken, why don't you take us away on LCI Industries? This is a stock that I've been familiar with for a, a lot of years. I've owned it off and on uh, at various times. Uh, in fact, I just took a new position in LCI Industries in uh, one of uh, the IR, IRA accounts that my wife and I maintain. Uh, I do notice that LCI Industries is starting to use the brand name Lippert uh, on a lot of what it's doing, uh, a lot of its uh, publicity, a lot of its uh, 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 financial reports and everything. And I was just wondering out loud whether they might be considering changing the name of the corporation eventually to Lippert. Uh, this graphic in the bottom here with the uh, RV and the beautiful lake view uh, comes from the opening page of their newest investor presentation. And if you'll notice, instead of uh, branding it LCI Industries, they branded it Lippert. So Lippert is one of their major brands, 
and they are attaching the name Lippert to some of their European uh, uh, companies as well. Let's get into this if we can. Next slide, if you would, Mark. Uh, this is a triple play. Uh, I think that when the high uh, projected value is 20%, uh, that's a, an indication that you might have a depressed stock price. Uh, you can see the PE moving from 14.5 to 17 in the three to five year period. Uh, this uh, whole value line was based on $149, and the stock closed um, Monday night uh, under $145. So the numbers are going to hold pretty well. Notice that there's also a, an estimation that we're going to see an increase in profit margins three to five years compared to where we are in 2020, five, seven to seven, five. So this is a triple play. That doesn't mean it's an automatic buy. Uh, what it does mean, however, in a uh, in a market that it has a lot of issues attached to them, LCI maybe should move towards the top of your study list as you're looking for stocks to maybe take a position in. Next slide, please. Uh, the overview is uh, that they have lots of leading brands. You can see some of the brand names there. Uh, they operate in seven core competencies, and they're constantly in their investor material referring to these core competencies. And then these competencies uh, move into a number of different customer segments and the segments are where their business is divided. So they have a recreational vehicle segment and a marine segment, and you can read the rest of them all the way down. Uh, OEMs uh, are their major uh, uh, customer. Uh, they, they sell directly to original equipment manufacturers, but they also are working very hard to boost their aftermarket presence so that they can sell parts uh, directly to consumers like you and me. Next slide. Uh, their uh, stated goal is to grow their adjacent, their aftermarket, and their international markets to about 60% of sales by 2022. And that would put them squarely then in some of the higher margined business that exists. Now, adjacent markets means when you develop something for an RV, for a recreational vehicle, many times you can then use it in a boat, or you can use it in a school bus, or you can use it in another type of vehicle. That's what they mean by adjacent. Aftermarket would be selling parts. Uh, directly to the uh, consumer, to the public, and their international uh, uh, business is meant to capitalize on the fact that in a lot of Europe, uh, the trends for RVs are moving in the exact same direction as the trends are in North America, and that's an exciting growth opportunity that's happening right as you kind of watch it. Next slide. Uh, the, the market is, and they're calling it massive, uh, the last fiscal year was the fourth highest on record. And when you consider what was going on last fiscal year with the pandemic uh, in the 2020 year, for them to have sold the fourth highest number of recreational vehicles for the industry to have sold that much uh, is really remarkable. Uh, I'm not going to read this slide to you, but this investor presentation on LCI's website uh, is very, very well done. It's written in simple English, and if you're interested in the company, I, I urge you to take and go through the 40 or 50 slides that are in that investor presentation. I've just chosen four or five to to highlight some of the things that I think are important. Next slide. Uh, their biggest operation is still in North America with original equipment manufacturers, uh, but they're constantly building out with these adjacent industries. 
So their primary competency was in recreational vehicles, uh, things like, that looked like buses, things that uh, you don't pull with another vehicle, but they've moved to fifth wheels or trailers to a lot of different types of commercial vehicles, trucks, school buses, uh, delivery vans. Uh, they've found that a lot of their materials uh, are being sought by people that are building structures. So they now have a pretty big building products uh, unit. And of course, uh, they're moving into marine, uh, which is another really fast growing segment of the RV industry. Next slide. Uh, the key drivers in, in this original equipment manufacturing is the surge in retail demand. They cannot keep RVs on the lots right now. Uh, they're building them as quickly as they can. Uh, they're suffering a little bit from some of the same problems that automobile makers have, where they're not able to get as many chips as they need. Uh, these vehicles are really high tech in a lot of cases, uh, so you need the chips. But uh, if you just drive by any of these dealers, you'll note that they, their lots look just like a lot of car dealer lots look right now. They're practically empty. And if you want a, a brand new RV, you're going to have to wait for it. Uh, 2020, the RV shipments were 430,000 units. There's that fourth highest wholesale year on record. And they feel that they're going to be able to move past half a million units. Notice the amount of content near the bottom that LCI provides to a typical RV, about $3,500 in content. And uh, they're trying to grow that by 4 or 5% uh, year over year, quarter over quarter. So. Uh, they, they put a lot into these RVs that they make themselves. Next slide. Uh, the aftermarket is heavy duty. Uh, you know if you repair your automobile that you pay a lot more for parts than probably uh, you should have to pay for parts. Uh, parts have higher margin and you can sell to not only the RV people, but again, to the adjacent industries. Next uh, slide. Uh, the key drivers of the aftermarket sector are the margins. Uh, these margins are so much higher, and one of LCII's uh, big thrusts is to raise their margin, to raise their profit. And one way they see themselves getting to that increased profit margin is to uh, double the size uh, or more of the aftermarket sector uh, segment of their business. Next slide. Uh, they have a big presence in uh, international. Most of this is European, but they are moving into parts of Asia. They're moving into South Africa, a little bit of a presence in uh, Central America, uh, and, and a little bit in South America, but not very much. Most of this is in Europe. Uh, the key drivers, of co uh, again, are the fact that uh, the European consumers uh, are beginning to mimic their cousins in North America. And they're getting a lot of people traveling and vacationing outside of their own country and even outside of their own continent. Uh, you know, you have the luxury in Europe to travel by land uh, to Asia or to Africa, if you wish. Uh, the international net sales are increasing. And again, uh, they're, they're, they're coming with, with high profit margins, and that's something that LCII is focused on. Next slide. Uh, they're very acquisitive, uh, 50 acquisitions in the last 20 years. Many of the acquisitions are very precise, small companies that fill a niche uh, in manufacturing something for an RV. Uh, they're getting a little bit bolder, however, as they move into more and more types of, of uh, vehicles and more and more types of, of 
industry. Uh, you can see some recent uh, acquisitions on the right. Uh, I don't have an RV, so none of these names uh, sound familiar to me. But for some of you out there, some of those names might come as a surprise that they're actually owned by RC or LCI. Next slide. Uh, I like to go to Manifest uh, when I first start studying a company. I'm looking for a par value. Uh, if I can find it uh, at 15 or better. Uh, and uh, right now, LCII uh, has a par value from Manifest of 14.9. I want to see steady or increasing quality. That's the blue line on the Chronicle. And certainly, uh, you could uh, indicate that that line, especially for the last couple of years, has been moving steadily in an upward direction. And I like to buy the stock uh, when it's a little bit higher historically as far as par is concerned than it's maybe been over the last couple of years in time. It's not at a historic high. Uh, back in 20, what is that, 18 maybe? Uh, that would have been a great time to, to buy LCII, but uh, I'm looking at a place here near the end where that par value is pretty decent. Uh, although it's at a much higher stock price uh, right now for me to take a, a gander at. Next slide. Nice up straight in parallel. Uh, the pandemic didn't really make much difference to the company. Uh, it is cyclical. Uh, most RV stocks have some cyclicality to it, uh, but I'm looking at higher highs and higher lows. Uh, it, it recently, the stock has broke out above its high value from 2020. Uh, that's a sign that uh, things have been going extremely well. Uh, I've decided that growth figures going forward are uh, pretty valid at about 15% growth in sales going forward and about 12% growth in uh, earnings going forward. This is a good, solid, medium-sized company, and that means that I'm looking at numbers at the top end of where I would have expectations for a medium company. Very healthy growth going on. You can see the growth in the most recent quarter was absolutely phenomenal. Next slide. I use those two growth figures along with a 22 high average PE and about a 12 low average PE and about a 45% payout ratio. They do pay a significant dividend. And uh, that's important for those of you that are uh, looking to get some income from your investments as well as some growth. Uh, you can afford to sit and hold this one and be paid back with a, a pretty nice dividend uh, somewhere in the maybe three, four, even 5% yield range. Uh, the projected return that I'm coming up with in my SSG is 13.5. Uh, that's close enough to, to the manifest number of 14.9 uh, that I'm pretty confident about uh, my the work that I'm doing here. And uh, I think that I've been pretty conservative in my calls uh, for my judgment. So I'm hoping that any uh, new news will be to the good side and the projected return will even be a little bit higher uh, than I anticipated. Next slide, Mark. I think this was the last, no, one more, okay. Uh, this is to me an extremely uh, optimistic paragraph coming from uh, something that I've been reading for the last 25 years. Uh, they, they just hit all the right points as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and uh, this is a pretty new uh, paragraph as well, uh, just a you know, uh, month and a half, something like that. Uh, the text was written using a closing price of $149. Uh, LCI closed Monday at 144. I'm not sure what it closed at today, but I'm suggesting we add uh, a position in LCII to the tracking portfolio. All right. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, that is a pretty strong 
statement there from value line for this one. All right. Sire, are you prepared to reinforce the selections of MKS <laughs> instruments? I'll, I will do my best. Um, I guess, first of all, I should uh, 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 wish MKS instruments a happy anniversary uh, because when I was um, uh, taking a look at past presentations, I realized that um, I had presented this July of 2019 um, to the round table. So this is our second anniversary together. <laughs> um, you see that um, sales growth is um, you know, generally uh, quite consistent, um, somewhat cyclical, which is not unusual for someone that supports semiconductor stocks, though we'll talk a little bit, or semiconductor manufacturers, um, though we'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we look at the company uh, going in. Um, the uh, earnings lines, uh, as reported, as you can see, are somewhat um, volatile, yet certainly moving in the right directions. And we'll say a little bit more again about the two years, but I will point out the two recent down years with these as reported uh, figures, that being 2016 and 2019, uh, that's significantly impacted by major acquisitions. Uh, notice that uh, there was a little bit of a, um, a, a downturn Probably it's obviously not a COVID downturn in 2019, but there was some world um, economic weakness that was impacting some of the uh, tech areas and semiconductor that probably hit there, but that's mostly acquisition uh, cost driven. Um, unlike the beautiful low range write up that uh, LCI just, uh, that Ken just showed for LCI, um, Value line is much more positive short term on MKSI and a little less so long term, as you can see, uh, with the long term projections. Uh, but what kind of attracts me uh, to this company right now is notice that uh, for the 18 month uh, price target, a 30 percent return, which is certainly a very positive. And if they come in 10 or a little better, even in the long range, uh, that's not a bad uh, return either. And of course, our methodology comes out uh, with, we, we have our long-term methodology and we'll see how that turns out, uh, which is why I'm bringing it tonight. Next slide. Um, I came up with this mostly because MKSI's just kept appearing on some screens uh, that I've been running for a couple of months, actually. Uh, and I was looking at some new stocks, either in the financial area or maybe even getting a little frisky for me uh, in perhaps some um, healthcare um, company stocks, not um, uh, healthcare facility type stocks, uh, rehab centers, long-term care. But they um, they just ended up being a little bit um negative right now uh, for me. So I decided to go ahead and go with the uh, MKSI uh, uh, doing a quick industry study. You see ranked by quality. Um, it's right up there with the leaders in the industry. So it's good. Next slide. And it's the highest um, projected return according to uh, Manifest right now. And of course, you see uh, they are also two six in that uh, group, uh, which is also in the round table portfolio. Uh, next slide. Here's what Value Line says they do. This is a company that it's easy to get bogged down and overcomplicate. Um, in fact, when I was preparing these slides, I looked at the uh, company press release on dividends that they issued today. Um, uh, declaring um, a 22 cent dividend again um, and where they described and it's kind of interesting their core competencies go on for about five lines but it really boils down to they are experts in dealing with the presence or absence of gases that's really 
uh, the, the simplest way that it seems uh, to make sense to me to describe what they do. As you see, value line uh, talks about measuring, controlling, analyzing gases. They deal with vacuum tubes, which is the absence of gases. And they did that primarily for semiconductor manufacturers up until about five years ago. They've started expanding that into lasers, fiber optics, flat panel solar cells used by the defense industry, by the life and health science industries, and many other industries. But they, they really deal with gases and how you apply gases in manufacturing various components to other high-tech devices. That's really what they do. Next slide. Here's some of the products. The, they uh, have control uh, measurement. They have gauges, injection systems, uh, valves, and the like. They also service all of their equipment. So they're a service company as well as a, a manufacturer. These are kind of the sellers of pick and shovels really to the people who make pick and shovels for end products. Uh, they're, they're kind of two levels removed from the RV that perhaps you buy or the car or the flat panel television or the uh, cell phone. Uh, they, they manufacture things that the manufacturers of the parts of all of those devices make. Next slide. Here's a slide from their invest, latest uh, investor presentation that you could see on their uh, website. <coughs> Excuse me. And what they're really, uh, again, the kind of the theme of this presentation, I thought was kind of an interesting one. They basically say the world's getting harder. It's getting tougher to manufacture. It's getting tougher to compete. And we help people manufacture and compete. Notice the focus on miniaturization and technical manufacturing processes. Again, moving out of semiconductors into uh, lasers and uh, other more advanced um, manufacturing processes um, that began again in the semiconductor process. Next slide. Here's kind of the shift as they've moved into what they call the advanced markets, the advanced markets being, uh, as I said, the lasers for solar panels, for life sciences, for <coughs> manufacturers and the like. That's what uh, the company calls advanced markets, which is now approaching uh, just a little under half their business. And the other half is their uh, um, equipment for semiconductor manufacturers. Uh, in the last five years, they've moved from seven leading product categories to 15. They've more than doubled. Company defines that as when they're first or second in market share. They've more than doubled their patents. And of course, you can see the revenue and uh, non-GAAP earnings per share. Fabulous growth over the last five years and their stock price reflects that growth. Next slide. Here they're getting a little bit more uh, detail. I'm not going to read this slide to you or go into it, but just kind of look at the big picture. Semiconductor, they're in the etching and the lithography. They, they do the wafers, essentially, or help manufacture the wafers. That's the basis for semiconductor. And then you see uh, the three main areas that they work in the advanced markets, industrial uh, technologies, the life sciences, and then uh, defense areas. Next slide. Here's, we've talked about what they manufacture, what they make. Here's how they do it. Here's how they create value for us as investors. They started with um, being a critical manufacture of equipment for semiconductors. They then sought to expand that competency into other areas. Their business model is essentially produce a lot of cash, use that cash to go out and acquire companies with new technology, 
integrate those companies, increase profit margins, pay down the debt used for the acquisition, and go do it all over again. That's the business transformation, the financial execution uh, language or uh, areas kind of in English. And then they create long-term earnings and growth with significant good returns on equity. Next slide. Revenue and earnings, we saw that uh, in the slide that had the breakdown between the semiconductor and the advanced markets, but this just gives you a, another reinforcement um, with the nice hand on the left-hand chart applauding their 23% uh, <laughs> revenue growth uh, and then their uh, even better earnings growth. Next slide. Here's just a picture of what I described about their generate a lot of cash. Here is their historical uh, free cash flow. That's cash flow after uh, investing and capital needs, um, CapEx needs. And uh, so they generate this cash flow, use that then to support going out, acquiring companies using debt, and then paying down the debt. And we'll see actually how they use the cash flow in, um, in detail, notice that they uh, talk about the latest low cash flow is greater than what I will call the old MKSI, the pre-advanced market stage. Uh, it's higher than the peak. So again, these advanced markets are generating a lot of cash for the company. Next slide. Here's what they do with the cash. They're very clear that uh, much of their strategy is acquisition, and they spend about half of that cash flow for acquisitions, two big ones in the last five years. Um, they invest the next good chunk into product development, R&D, we would call it. So as they summarize at the bottom, 70% of this capital, of this generated free cash is put back into uh, growth opportunities. Then they uh, pay off debt and uh, pay dividends and then occasional share buybacks. Next slide. This is just examples of, again, their strategy with acquiring companies and then increasing profit margins after the acquisition. Uh, these are the last two large uh, acquisitions, and you can see what they have done with uh, delivering margin improvements. Next slide. Here's their goal. Uh, for the semiconductor business, uh, there is a, a measure of the semiconductor uh, industry called the Wafer Fabrication Equipment Index. They're saying they'll exceed that by two percentage points or 200 basis points. Um, the advanced markets, they'll uh, exceed GDP. Uh, that's the growth of the U.S. economy as a whole by 300 basis points. That's if if they hit that, that's probably a little below historical sales growth. Uh, then they give you the um, uh, other components of um, various expenses uh, to include the tax rate, which is what I use. But notice what they anticipate earnings. They anticipate through margin growth to have a short term over the next uh, five years, earnings per share grow twice as fast as their revenues. So even if their revenues come down a bit, uh, they're projecting uh, significant increases in earnings. Again, you know we know that that can't happen forever, but five years is certainly a very foreseeable time frame for management to have that as a strategy. Next slide. Here are my judgments. Uh, I left sales growth at about the historical rate of, of 12%, which is in line uh, with uh, manifest consensus projections. Uh, might be a little high given what I just showed you uh, a moment ago. Uh, some of that's going to depend on that WFE, where exactly it lands. That's usually higher than GDP. 
the the uh, GDP plus three percent. If that goes historical, that's going to be in the mid single digits, um, mid upper single digits, six, seven, eight uh, percent. The the um, semiconductor growth could be a bit faster than that. So the company may be projecting a little lower than that, but again. Um, uh, the 12% earnings growth rate that I end up with is uh, still very much in line with their projection because notice the expenses I'm using, uh, profit margin above the uh, average for the last five years, but well below the current and below what the company's projecting. So I'm kind of taking a show me attitude on profit uh, margins there. Um, then their tax rate, and that leads me to a five-year estimate of about $13 um, dollars a share. Next slide. Uh, 30 PE uh, projection um, leads to an annualized um, rate of return of um, a little over 19%. And uh, actually, I'm sorry, that 10% is the low PE, so the average PE is 20. That's a, an error on my slide. The average PE is 20, which is a little below the manifest consensus, which I think is 23, uh, and that would lead to uh, an 11% return uh, manifest is a, no, no, the 30 is correct, Mark. The 10 is the incorrect. The 10 should be 20. Yep, there we go. Thank you, sir. <laughs> now the slide's correct. Um, so, so there, that's that's certainly a significant range, but there's a, you know, the 10% is a good solid return. The potential to return 20 is spectacular in this market. And uh, so I'm saying let's add another chunk of MKSI. Okay, thanks, I. All right, I'm gonna lean on my typical practice of showing you where ideas come from. And in this case, I want to share recent screening results. Um, my primary screen was I, I went for a quality ranking greater than 80, which would make all of these excellent companies ranked in the top quintile. Um, in a market like today's market, some, I might dial that up to 90 if I'm, if I'm really serious about uh, uh, being conservative and a little less opportunistic. Um, but the market does seem to be behaving itself. Um, my overriding thesis is that the gains we've made basically put us back on the trajectory we were already on, maybe a little bit more robust than that, but pretty close to that. So I'm okay hunting for excellent companies. The secondary screen was this projected return on value, a first cousin to the projected annual return. And what I've listed is the double digit projected return on value from uh, highest to lowest. And basically starting shopping at the top of that list, looking for candidates. I am gonna go ahead and go with Green Brick Partners, but I presented Micron Tech last month. And uh, you'll note that there are a number of uh, home builders, residential construction on here. There's also a number of companies from the material sector, uh, specifically steel that grabs my attention and one that really kind of jumps off the page at me and to our cincinnati uh listeners uh i believe steel dynamics is actually headquartered near there there's some pretty good numbers on this line also um that make would make steel dynamics a pretty decent study and uh, i see charlene hansen's malibu boats is on the list so that was one of the other selections from the recent successful investing conference, along with Ken's Alimentacion Couchtard at the bottom there, still hanging in there. I presented iRobot, so some some themes that are recurring. Um, and as I said, when I got started, uh, Matt Spielman presented Green Brick Partners during that successful investing conference. So if you want a, a little more depth on this, Matt spent uh, a few minutes going through his uh, perspective on it and Matt has the advantage of living in the middle of uh, the current day adventures of Green Brick Partners. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. Who are these guys? They are a land developer that is tied up to a 
home building company. And uh, so they're into land acquisition and development. So they strategically uh, identify developments for neighborhoods and that sort of thing, prepare the property properties, and then participate with uh, a pretty select group of home builders where they have controlling uh, majority interest in these companies that are respected in the areas where they operate. And it's a, a really interest, interesting uh, example of vertical integration. They believe that uh, significant margins can be realized in the, the, real, the, the land, the real estate uh, part of the transaction. And that, that's kind of what they focus on, basically optimizing that. Um, home for them is the Dallas, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And they have expanded in recent years out to Atlanta, and as we'll see, then into Florida and Colorado. They do focus very carefully on high growth areas where demand for their uh, projects will be high. Specifically where? Again, starting in Dallas with uh, the land that they owned in Dallas and continue to develop. And again, a number of uh, respected legacy builders in, in the specific area. So they don't try to compete against these guys. They basically partner up with them. Hence the title of the, the company. And then they have taken that and successfully branched out into four uh, growth areas. They're not going to, uh, uh, at least anytime soon, go into any of the areas of the country where they don't believe they can uh, benefit from the demand provided by uh, elevated, exciting growth. So you see Texas, Florida, Georgia, specifically Atlanta, and uh, most recently the Colorado area with some uh, home builders that may, may be familiar to people from those areas. Well, we are, are seeing, and this is something that Matt has covered, it's a topic that uh, Ken Kavula has covered a number of times, is the shifting demographic uh, and what, it, what it's doing to uh, the demographic profile in the United States. And I think this kind of hit us as a, a bit of a surprise here in the last couple of years, because following the Great Recession, and uh, the problems that the home building market faced following that. Um, we've been uh, really facing some issues. We'll take a closer look at that in a second. But in the, in the background, kind of the underswell of this entire movement is this demographic shift to this sudden surge in demand for you know, people who reach a certain age, they become interested in uh, owning a home. And uh, that's what you're looking at here. So you have a built-in uh, tailwind, if you want to call that, or uh, an uprising or an upwelling of demand for places to live. You combine that with uh, the situation that we had back in the, the problem that erupted right in here with housing back in the 2007-2008 timeframe basically everything fell apart in the real estate industry. Uh, a lot of home builders went out of business and uh, the the rate of home ownership just basically began dropping off the cliff. And uh, that has continued to be the case while the demand for uh, housing has actually started to take off and some of the urban shifting to the the rural areas is behind some of this. But again, this is just this complete demographic shift that uh, is creating opportunity for a number of home builders, not limited to these guys. And that's why you've seen the presentations from uh, a number of the participants here in our community. The illustration at the top is the type of uh, development they might be involved with. You can see the stock price at the bottom of the page here from uh, the time that they kind of broke away from the SPAC-like entity that they were a little over five years ago to the form that they are now. And uh, they actually had a pretty good run coming out of the uh, beginnings of the COVID drop. Now, one of the things that's a little bit uh, hard to catch here is, you know, we're talking about a, a stock price that was around 13 or 14 dropping down to less than six. So they actually did it. That it doesn't seem like that much, but 
that's a 50% drop in price down to the bottoms, the March bottoms of the COVID situation. And you can see how they have erupted out of that, uh, basically quadrupling in stock price. So it's a pretty good run. It's reflected in uh, some of the strength that you see here. I did throw on this screen an indicator that we've been talking about. Uh, the MFI, that's basically my interpretation of it is it's a, a volume weighted uh, RSI. So it, it, it's basically a relative strength index that accounts for volume. And we're, we're basically raking that over the coals right now. But um, not terribly overpriced right now. It's been in a bit of a flat spot for a while, even though, you know, you basically have this demand situation going on. So that's a, a good deal. The, the demand is there and uh, the flat spot sometimes can lead to interesting opportunity. Here's a look at some of the actual uh, number characteristics for the company. You can see it's been on a pretty good trajectory. Uh, the analyst consensus mysteriously does show a bit of a downdraft out here, but uh, interesting to see what happens to that here in a few days when they have their earnings report. But that's a, a pretty good up straight and parallel for the type of industry that these guys are in, and especially into the the market that they're serving. You see improving profitability down here and PEs that are leveling off in the high single digits. So we're talking about a billion dollar company uh, growing at about 15%, that's the trend line, uh, with a projected net margin somewhere in the low teens, um, a PE ratio in, the, again, high single digits. So we're, we're talking about a projected annual return of 17 to 18%. When you look at that projected return on value, that confirms that pull position that it had in that first screening slide in the low 20s, the fact that these two align pretty well with each other means that uh, got a pretty pretty high level of confidence that the, the PE showing up here is fairly reasonable. And so we're looking at a company with um, relatively high returns and a really favorable characteristic. The one thing that I will point out, um, we're only a few days from the earnings report, and that can make for some extreme volatility in stocks. And not only that, they have their annual investor day a couple days later next week. So uh, the stock could move significantly up or down around that type of an event. And you know who you are as an investor. Perhaps you factor that in. Perhaps you, if you have an interest in this company, you would uh, you can register online for the investor day and sit through the, the presentation and learn more about the company and then make your decision. But uh, just be be warned that we could be looking at a little bit of price activity um, here over the next couple of days. All right. So with that, I, I did leave an Ardellic slide in here just to show the the order of magnitude of the situation. Uh, I think if Kim or he were here, they would uh, either one or both might be arguing for a purchase, not a selling of our, our Delix, but a purchase. Uh, you can see that the company did go from nine. I wasn't exaggerating. It went from approximately nine to uh, approximately $2 in a matter of 10 minutes. So what Sai was telling you, you, you would have had no hope with a, a loss order in here of any kind. Uh, it happened after hours also in a span of about 10 minutes. Uh, it dropped that amount. It dropped that far in the portfolio. So, again, we've, we've selected it seven times at a cost basis of around three. But it is down there. The one thing I do note in this look back at the, the five years that we've been tracking it since Hugh's original selection, we're back at the low. Some technicians might suggest that that could be a support level for the company. Could be. I don't know. So with that, Ken, I think we can go ahead and launch the poll. If you're still with us. Mark, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I didn't know whether I turned myself off or on when Roxy was barking here. Uh, so let me get the poll up here if I can. There we go. 
and we'd love for you to pick one of these uh, so we can add a position to the round table. Keep in mind that you're welcome to vote even if it's your first time <coughs> here. We do keep track of votes for Christmas card purposes and, and hate mail. <laughs> Uh, we do like to see 85 or 90% voting. We're up to 82% voting, 83%, 84%, 85. Okay, I'm going to count to 10 in my mind and then close the voting down. And we got to 89% voting. And here are the results. Uh, as soon as I share them, here are the results. Yes. It looks like we're going to add LCII to the uh, position for the audience uh, on LCII. Okay. All right. And they they people like Green Brick and MKS both pretty. There's not a laggard in the in the group here, although we had a few folks didn't like any of them tonight. So, yeah, we don't usually get a lot of none of the above votes. So I, I had toyed with the notion of putting uh, an unsupported Ardelix on there to see if the audience would vote for it or not, but I wasn't sure how that would go. And you're looking at a placeholder on the screen right now. So well, there we go, Mark. Okay. I'll get rid of it then. All right. All right. We have some coming attractions. We do have the, the webcast of expected returns. We'll, we call it the review. Uh, we'll take care of that on August 7th. Now, that's a Saturday morning, and that's a monthly webcast where we simply go through the, the newsletter at Manifest Investing. The next uh, roundtable in August, I'm pretty sure I have this right. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ken. Do we, do we have any reason not to do August 31st? Oh, August 31st looks good to me, Mark. Okay. And we do have an appearance with uh, basically that's Cleveland, but Northeast Ohio in a webcast. I believe that's also a Saturday morning. Yes, it is. So on September 18th, and then we continue to hope that the NAIC National Convention in Dallas towards the end of October is, is pulled off this year. And we uh, look forward to participating in that. Most of the nights and damsels will be involved. Be good to see uh, your smiling faces. Hmm. We will be adding a few things to this. Uh, do either of you have anything to add? Uh, I will be doing uh, online and other people to. I believe Kim is also participating in the Georgia chapter education fair on Saturday, August the twenty-first. Uh, so people may want to look at that, and then I'm doing a co sponsored stock up an online chapter event the following Thursday on um, 826 which I think is called reflections of a long term lifelong investor where I'm just going to tell you everything I know or don't know about investing now is that open to uh, the public side or is that just they, a they, better investing I, I'm since it's put on by the online chapter, I'm not certain, Mark, to, to know for sure. I think Stock Ups are our member. Stock event. Ups are now, member benefits. Right, yeah. they're member. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know about the online since, because it originally was an online chapter event. Which, right. Um, and, then, and then it became co-sponsored by, you know, by home office, by Stock Up. Um, and I'm not sure how they're dealing with that to be honest i'm i'm on the presenting end not the okay. so that i don't know now the georgia chapter i'm pretty sure is is member and non-member both okay because i can look at adding that to our event profile at, at manifest if yeah. they can actually get access to it all right and then as a reminder ken and i have been doing uh bull sessions on tuesdays and uh I don't know. It's been fun for me, Ken. I hope it's, it's fun for you. I have, we've been getting wonderful feedback from the audience, especially after it, some it of the It is enjoyable, are. Mark. It really is. So we just pick a topic and, and go for it. And uh, 
have a few traditions that are beginning to erupt around that event also. <laughs> you can find out, You can if you go to the manifest.com forward slash events, you can see when those events are happening. Those are at 2 o'clock on Tuesdays. All right, and if you can't attend them in person because you have a day job, as many people do, um, we do archive all of those presentations on YouTube under Manifest Investing. If you do the search, you will find a page that looks something like that. And uh, those happen to be all 15 of the successful investing webcasts that we've done over the last year and a half. And, uh, you know, for instance, I had a few topics uh, a few people asked me questions about the the projected return on value that was actually covered a couple of times, including this one. So if you want to go back and and take a look at projected return on value, that was the subject of that particular uh, successful investing conference. And uh, Ken and I always talk about the small companies. You can see there is that reflections by that long term investor right here talking about stacking the deck there in a presentation from just a few months ago stacking the deck in your favor and reflecting as a long-term investor all right if you'd like to be reminded anytime more content is placed on that particular youtube page just hit the subscribe button and uh, we'd be happy to let you know when that is the case so with that ken i think we've got i'm showing nine well we're, we're actually running right on schedule I'm going to entertain a question from Claire Redmond. Claire has his hand up. Okay. Claire, uh, Claire, you're muted on your side. If you want to speak, you'll have to unmute on your side. Yes, uh, Ken and uh, Mark, our affair is going to be no charge, only a contribution if you so desire. And it's going to be a one day, a one day event that we cover. 12 topics. Okay. And Claire, can they get more information from your website on the BI website? Yes, it's there. The Georgia chapter yeah. website. Yeah, folks, you, you want to go to the Better Investing website and then look under chapters and look for the Georgia chapter. And there should be some information there on not only what the program will be, but how you can register for it. Yeah, and as as I was saying, Kim is going to be part of that also. I'm pretty sure she's teaching classes down there. Doug Gerlock is also going to be on. Okay, and Doug the and Cy. Excellent. So I will also include that so that uh, manifest subscribers are, can be aware of it and get access to it if they're if they're interested. Thanks, Claire. Sure. And for the women, we have a lady from a brokerage house going to give uh, speeches on or presentations on uh, economics for women, for the most part, what they need to look for and as they grow older. Okay. Very cool. So anything else, Ken, as we look at uh, uh, Petoskey Sunset over Lake Michigan? No, we uh, took pretty much uh, most of the questions during the time, Mark. Uh, and uh, we do have a question, Mark. How can they register for the expected returns? That event listing will be up within the next day. So if they, if they watch the Manifest Investing homepage or come back and check that events link, it'll be there, I suspect, sometime tomorrow. Okay. And other than that, we're pretty caught up on questions. I don't have any other hands raised. So I'd like to, uh, as usual, thank Cy uh, for his time and Mark for everything that you do for the uh, MidMichigan program here. And uh, let's uh, click our glasses together and hope for another couple of years of successful roundtables, okay? Can we eat some cake? You can eat as much cake as you'd like, Mark. Okay. All right. I'll let I'll let you take that up with Wendy. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Everybody have a, a good midsummer. We'll see you in about a month for the round table. And again, uh, those of you who attend Tuesday afternoons, love doing that with you also. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night, again, everybody. Guys.